what can we do to make our soil healthier? Yeah, so there's a growing interest in uh, soil health among farmers, among agronomists. Um, it's, it's really kind of a movement that in many respects is being led by farmers in different parts of the world. And what is soil health? It's the ability of the soil to keep producing, um, uh, to keep producing crops over the long run without being degraded. And it tracks into the abundance of life in the soil and the character of that life in that soil. Is it beneficial to the crops or is it pests and pathogens? A healthy, fertile soil is more of the former and less of the latter. And what are the practices that one can do to build healthy, fertile soil? It really boils down to things that cultivate the beneficial life in the soil. Because most soil life is either, you know, doesn't help crops or is beneficial to them. It's very specific organisms that tend to be the pests and pathogens. But it's diverse communities of organisms that are producing metabolites and getting mineral elements out of the soil and interacting with the plants in what Ann and I called the biological bazaar. It's a great under, the original underground economy that where plants are pushing out food, sugars, proteins, fats into the soil to attract and recruit particular kinds of microbes that make things out of the, that food, their metabolites, their waste products, that actually help the health and growth of the plants. And sort of cultivating those kind of interactions and relationships are the way to really build healthy fertile soil as a consequence of agriculture. And what I, one of the things I learned in interviewing farmers around the world for gr growing a revolution was that it really boils down to almost three principles, um, which is minimize disturbance of the soil, um, which equates to things like no-till farming, farming without the plow, planting seeds directly into the ground without turning the ground over. And there's, there's technologies now to do that. Uh, the second piece of, of, um, of the stool um, that, that holds up um, to scrutiny is growing cover crops, um, keeping the ground covered with a living plant something where there's a root alive in the soil, but also the ground is covered by leafy matter through the course of the year. So if you're a cash crop farmer, in between one's cash crops, plant cover crops. What cover crops also do is if you basically kill them and let them rot back on the fields, they're a source of carbon that then decays and feeds the soil life. They're also a source of action that's getting mineral elements out of the soil. And the third element is growing a diversity of crops. You propose three things for the soil that will improve and maintain its fertility. What are they, and why are they so important to growing crops? In visiting farmers around the world for writing Growing a Revolution, I found that the ones who'd been very successful at restoring fertility to their land had three common principles in co that governed the practices they used on their farms. And it was minimizing disturbance of the soil, keeping the ground covered with the cover crop, and growing a diversity of crops. And what those three things are, and why they work so well to rebuild the fertility of land, is that's a recipe for um, cultivating the beneficial life in the soil. And if you look at those three principles, they're 180 degrees from what we've spent the last 100 years teaching people in terms of modern farming, where we've taught them to plow a lot, to use a lot of agrochemicals, and to grow one or two crops. What we're talking about here is a different philosophy that underpins how you think about the land, how you think about the soil, how you treat the land as the foundation for developing farming practices that could apply in both conventional and in organic systems. It's, it's sort of a very different debate and argument. Um, thinking about soil health translates across cropping systems and you know, it extends into you know, agroforestry, into uh, viticulture. Um, the idea of trying to cultivate the beneficial life in the soil as a way to promote the health and growth of plants really cuts across the board. If we stop plowing, how are we going to farm? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. It's one of the ones I wrestled with in writing the dirt book and, and again in Growing a Revolution. And we have ways now of doing no-till farming where instead of having a plow that inverts the soil, literally turns the soil upside down, and, and they cut like a narrow little furrow or a, a narrow little trench about the width of my little finger and you plant seeds directly down into it. And there's companies that build these as commercial planters. Uh, John Deere, for example, would be happy to sell you one. Um, and you can walk behind one after they've planted and it's hard to tell that the ground is disturbed because you're planting through the remains of the previous crop. And so you can knock down the crop stubble from the prior crop, cut this little trench, pl plant right into it, 
And because your seeds are there first, they're the ones that come up first. They have advantage over any other we any weeds that could come in. And there's other methods of weed control that people use um, that I talk about in Growing Our Evolution. And you often hear about no-till farming, that it takes a lot of herbicides to practice that. And so I went and interviewed farmers who have figured out clever ways to not use a lot of herbicides, um, whether they're juggling the timing of when they plant. Some guys are planting into the corn before they harvest it. So when they harvest the corn, their cover crop is already up and ahead of the weeds. And then they kill the cover crop and plant the corn back through it. Um, and they can kill the cover crop with um, sort of like a, a big steamroller drum known as a crop roller. Um, some guys are bringing cattle in to graze off their cover crops, which I view as an accelerant on rebuilding soil because the cows will eat the, cro the crop um, residue and turn it into manure that gets back spread across the field and can be taken back, the elements in it can be taken back by the plants because they're more soluble than, than a corn stalk. Um, so there's, a lot, there's, there's clever ways people have been thinking about how to do this, but you'll notice that two out of those three principles, cover cropping and crop rotations, they're not new ideas. They're really ancient ideas. Traditional societies around the world practiced that. We were planting legumes into our crop rotations in various parts of the world for, for centuries, if not millennia, before we even knew what nitrogen was. Yeah, and the, you know, one of the benefits of legumes have is that they partner with nitrogen-fixing bacteria and sort of get natural fertilizer into the soil. Um, but people had, through experiences, figured out things that, that worked. What's new about this new style of farming is combining that ancient wisdom with the modern technology that allows us to do things like no-till farming. Getting those three pieces together, I think, could be transformative to agriculture. What are cover crops and what do they do for soil? Yeah, so a cover crop is a crop that you plant and grow, not so much for harvest, but to benefit the soil, to keep the ground covered so it's not going to erode. And they also extract mineral elements from the soil to build their bodies. And so when you grow a cover crop and you then kill the cover crop and you let it rot on your fields, you're using that cover crop to essentially generate natural fertilizer, where it's pulling elements through its you know, bacterial and fungal partners in the soil out into its body, it takes it from the subsoil, for example, gets it above ground when the plant dies or, and rots at the surface, those elements are released back into the topsoil and the roots of your next cash crop can take them back up as essentially fertilizer. So cover crops really sort of serve a couple purposes. Um, one is to help keep the soil on the land so it doesn't erode because it's bare earth that really erodes faster than anything. Um, but they also help with nutrient cycling. and. So you can view cover crops as kind of a, an investment in building soil quality that over time can generate a, a, a good return, both in terms of improved soil quality, but it also allows farmers to help offset and reduce some of their nitrogen fertilizer. Um, and if you build soil health up enough, it can really help offset the need for pesticides. And so a lot of farmers have found that by adopting this, series, this combination, uh, minimal disturbance, cover crops, and a diversity of plants, which helps get a diversity of microbes in the soil that provides a diversity of, of metabolites to help with crop health, that they're able to greatly reduce their fertilizer and pesticide and diesel use. What are the three biggest expenditures in modern conventional farming? It's, it's those three, fertilizer, diesel, and pesticides. And so if, if farmers can grow comparable yields, spending less on their inputs, they can do better economically. And I started teasing some of the farmers I was visiting who had adopted these practices, some of the early adopters who'd been very successful at it and, and really improved their soil. I started calling them organic-ish farmers because they were conventional farmers. They had no interest in being organic farmers, just based on their own personal situation. But they were hardly using any agrochemicals anymore. One of them is now completely off of synthetic nitrogen and pesticides. He's basically an organic farmer. But he didn't do it to be an organic farmer. He did it because that's the way you build the health and fertility of your land. Yeah, if you, if you leave a, a field sort of bare, a bare fallow, just a bare earth field, what happens when it rains and there's no plants covering the soil up? We've all seen like construction sites in the urban environment. After a good rainfall, the water running off of it is brown, right? It's full, it's full of soil that had been on that site. Well, farm fields are not that different. If you leave them bare, um, if there's nothing to protect the soil when you get a rain or a good wind storm, if you're in a windy area, that soil can leave, it can erode, and it can erode much faster than it was forming because nature takes centuries 
to form an inch of soil. You can lose an inch of soil in decades off of bare plowed fields. Those numbers are out by a factor of at least 10. And that's been one of the big backstories of civilization after civilization, where you don't notice the degradation of your soil year to year. Where you notice it is over the course of your lifetime. And the first times I went actually to farming communities around the American Midwest and was talking with people about long-term agricultural deterioration of the soil, I was a little worried about how it'd be received, right? So dropping into a farming community and talking about how the plow had taken down civilizations in the past. But I had older gentlemen stand up at, after some of my talks and basically said, I've seen what you're talking about on my farm. We have to change the way we farm so that our grandchildren will have better land than we have now because our grandparents have better land than we have now. And we've degraded it over the last hundred years in many regards. We've been able to maintain yields because we supplement with agrochemicals. But you know, we've got nitrogen problems in drinking water. We've got phosphorus problems in the Great Lakes. There's a great dead zone um, at the mouth of the Mississippi. We've got uh, health problems, you know, cancer hotspots in farming communities. Um, we've got residues of pesticides showing up in our foods and grocery stores and, and herbicides. Farming is ripe for a re-envisioning and a, re, a retooling in ways that will actually help build the fertility of the land and produce cleaner, healthier food off of the landscape. Um, and I think these, this pre these style of regenerative agriculture that can take conventional farms and turn them into organic-ish farms, these farms that use far less in the way of chemicals, that's where the opportunity for huge change lies in agriculture. Um, there's an awful lot of farmers in North America that, were, that won't become organic farmers overnight. Um, but I think that we could, over the next 20 or 30 years or so, convert conventional agriculture into an organic-ish style because it works for the farmers. In order for, for farming practices to be sustainable, they have to be profitable for the farmers or they won't be sustained. And that's one of the things that's turned me into an, an optimist on this issue, is the practices that can help us rebuild healthy, fertile soils can also help us with farm profitability, help us reduce their off-site environmental impacts, help us reduce the health impacts of modern agriculture. I have yet to find the reason we shouldn't go this route. And I'm very enthused and fairly optimistic about it. Because if we can pull off that transition in the next 20 or 30 years, that's fast. That's one of the advantages of being a geologist is, you know, I, you can be frustrated year to year, but if you have, you know, 5% change a year, over 20 years, it's the whole game. If the level of carbon and organic matter in soils were increased, to what they once were, how would this influence the amount of synthetic fertilizer and other agricultural chemicals that farmers use? There was a little known uh, study that came out back, I think it was 1978, um, where um, a, a, they looked at the isotopic composition of carbon in the atmosphere, and they were able to actually figure out that roughly a third of the carbon that had been added to the atmosphere uh, since the Industrial Revolution didn't come out of a smokestack or a tailpipe. It came from plowing up new farmland, from degrading, <clears throat> from degrading the organic matter in the soil. And there's every reason to believe we could put an awful lot of carbon back into the world's farmland soils if we changed our agricultural practices to these more conservation agricultural oriented practices because the microbial life will build up that carbon over time if we, if we change our farming practices so that we're not shooting it off the other direction. And if we did that, we could not only sequester um, a fair amount of carbon in the soil, but it would reduce our reliance on, on nitrogen fertilizers, which would reduce our production of, a very, uh, of other greenhouse gases. Um, and it would also uh, reduce our use of diesel in farming, because we wouldn't be plowing as much and driving tractors as much. Um, agriculture is one of these areas where if we reimagine it, if we rethink how it's done, we could have a big impact on the climate in terms of how much people est how much carbon people estimate we could put in the world's farmland soils. Frankly, the estimates are all over the map. From uh, but even the low end of the estimates are a good down payment on addressing the climate problem. The high end of the estimates, I mean, my personal opinion is, they're probably over oversold. I view uh, this new style of regenerative agriculture that can build soil organic matter, that can put carbon back in the ground as a key element in a planetary carbon management plan. But it's not a permanent solution. You can only put so much carbon in the soil. Um, but it could help us. It could be a real wedge in terms of dealing with the climate issue over the next century. 
Um, and the side benefit, healthier, more fertile land that can grow more food and feed more people better food. I mean, that's worth doing just for that right there. Can restoring soil help slow down or reverse climate change and other environmental problems? Yeah, if we look at the side benefits that we could get from restoring uh, health to the world's farmland soils by putting more carbon in the ground, building the organic matter content up, um, we could not only pull carbon from the atmosphere, which would, would help with the, with the climate problem, but it would also help us reduce off-site environmental impacts, reduce the nitrogen going into our, our water supplies and wells around cities. It could help, actually, it would help us conserve biodiversity because if we're using less pesticide on farms, we'll have more organisms on farms. And not all organisms are bad. One of the problems with broad-spectrum pesticides on farmland is that if we take a broad-spectrum pesticide, because there's some, like a, a corn pest, for example, and you apply it to a field, you kill all the things that eat that pest too. You're taking out all the predators. And what we, gen what we generally see is that um, the pests come back first. It's kind of like weeds. You know, your, your favorite plant your, your, doesn't come back in the garden first. Um, and pests are kind of the same way. So there's these other side benefits that would really flow from restoring healthy fertile soils that are just not restricted to on the farm. Um, and if we look at the global biodiversity problem, Something like 25% of the world's continental landmass is devoted to agriculture. A big part of what life is going to share this planet with us in the future is going to be the life on farms and on rangeland. And if we treat the land in ways that promote beneficial life, life that we like sharing the landscape with, while suppressing the pests and pathogens, we'll have a nicer world. Could you sum up your book in 10 words or less? Sure, ditch the plow, cover up, and grow diversity. That's the recipe for growing healthy, fertile soils. You could add livestock back into the mix if you want, and if the livestock's managed right in ways that could actually help build soil organic matter, but ditch the plow, cover up, and grow diversity, uh, in my view, is the real game changer.